Yesterday, we did a deep dive and examined the 48 core M1 Ultra Max Studio, which costs $4,000. But today, we're gonna jump a little bit further down the price ladder to this, the base model Mac Studio. This is the cheapest one out there and it is quite literally half the price of the Mac Studio we looked at yesterday. So the questions for this video are twofold. Number one, is the Mac Studio with M1 Ultra worth double the money of the M1 Max? And two, does the M1 Max perform any differently in a Mac Studio than it does in a MacBook Pro? Well, today we're gonna answer both of those questions. So make sure to get subscribed, hit like on this video, turn on notifications, cause I've got a lot of coverage coming at you guys and let's get into it. Oh, hey, uh, I'm just having a mental breakdown because I realized that I bought three Mac Studios, a studio display, the new keyboard, the iPad Air, and the new iPhone SE. So I got to make videos on all of that, and I spent like thirteen or $14,000. I'm probably going to go broke. But anyway, let's talk about a way that you could avoid going broke, and that is by buying the cheapest Mac Studio there is. $2,000. Now, straight off the bat, I am annoyed at Apple for doing this because they killed the 27-inch iMac. The 5K iMac was a fantastic package because it started at $1,800, and for that, you got this 5K display, you got the entire computer attached to it, you got the Magic Keyboard and the Magic Mouse all in the same box. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that if you add it all up here, you spend $2,000 on the Mac Studio, $1,600 on the display, $100 for the Apple keyboard without Touch ID, and $80 for the white Magic Mouse, you're already getting really close to $4,000, which would have bought you the highest spec iMac that you could imagine. But maybe that says more about the bad value of the display and less about the Mac Studio. So let's talk about that. And specifically, we should talk about what's actually different between this M1 Ultra and this M1 Max Mac Studio. Now, I said in the last video that I kind of think of these as two separate things, right? Because this is double the money of that. And there are differences. I mean, this, this weighs about two pounds more because of that copper core heatsink. Uh, you also get Thunderbolt ports on the front here. These two are Thunderbolt over here. They're just regular USB-C. But apart from that, the differences come down to the spec. The M1 Ultra has double of everything. CPU cores, GPU cores, unified memory, storage, media encoders, everything. And so you would think, well, this should be twice as fast, right? Well, let's find out. Let's go through some benchmarks. So starting off with Cinebench R23, we can see that the M1 Pro, Max, and the Max in the studio all score pretty much the same. What do you expect? It's the same CPU. We see the same thing in Geekbench 5 multi-core. They're all within about 1% of each other. And as you can tell, the M1 Ultra is about twice as powerful, who would have guessed? We see this again in V-Ray, which runs through Rosetta 2, where all of the 10-core CPUs score within just a few points of each other. But where things start to differ a little bit is when we introduce a GPU test like Basemark. Here we can see that the 24-core M1 Max in the Mac Studio does actually outperform the 24-core M1 Max in a 14-inch MacBook Pro. But of course, it doesn't quite get to the level of the 32-core M1 Max in a 16-inch MacBook Pro. This gets even more dramatic in Geekbench 5 Compute, where the 24-core Mac Studio is 10,000 points ahead of the 24-core 14-inch M1 Max. The GPU trend continues here in a practical real-world test, Shadow of the Tomb Raider. The 24-core 14-inch MacBook Pro scores 77 FPS, 
whereas the 24 core Mac Studio gets 90, only seven frames behind the 32 core M1 Max and the 16 inch MacBook Pro. This is a very impressive showing. In GFX Bench, as tech high tier off screen, things normalize a little bit, with both 24 core M1 Maxes scoring about the same and about half of an M1 Ultra. All right, so now let's talk about some video editing workloads. Here we have my two 30 minute 10 bit 4K 60 FPS clips stacked on top of each other and color corrected. Rendering took almost exactly the same time on the 24 core Mac Studio as it did on the 32 core MacBook Pro. Both were beaten by the M1 Ultra, but not by a huge margin. And when we move over to the export of this same project, the differences between all three of the Apple Silicon chips are negligible. The same holds true in DaVinci Resolve, where all three of these Apple Silicon chips are within a few seconds of each other, and both are cutting the export times of the iMac Pro in half. Finally, for video editing, we have Puget Bench in Premiere Pro. And here we see that the 24 core Mac Studio does in fact score lower than the 32 and 48 core Apple Silicon chips. And when we look at the graphics score, we can see things line up pretty proportionately given the number of GPU cores going from 24 to 32 to 48. So let's move on to 3D modeling with Octane X and the Teapot Render Target. Here we can see that another fairly proportional gap opens up between the number of GPU cores and the time taken to render. However, Blender gets a little bit more funky. In the BMW CPU render, we see, rather expectantly, that the M1 Max in both forms scores exactly the same, with the M1 Ultra being about half the time with twice the cores. But in the GPU render, using the Metal API, the M1 Max with 32 cores only saves us two seconds here compared to the 24 core Max Studio. Moving over to the classroom test, we see a similar story with the CPU, with both the 10 core MacBook Pro and Mac Studio scoring within two seconds of each other and in about twice the time of the M1 Ultra. But again, in the GPU test, we can see that we're not as far behind the 32 core M1 Max as you might expect. Okay, so what are we to make of all of that? Well, the first thing that really stands out to me is just how many differences there were between the M1 Max in here and the M1 Max that you would find in a MacBook Pro. Now, granted, my numbers for the 24 core GPU M1 Max were from a 14 inch, which is a little bit more limited than the 16 inch, but even so, just looking at the Tomb Raider FPS 77 to 90 with the same GPU, that is pretty impressive. And I think it really speaks to the cooling that is being implemented here on the Mac Studio. I've been incredibly impressed with the fact that I could throw all of these benchmarks at it and not hear the fans at all. In fact, this is what it sounds like halfway through a Cinebench run. Oh yeah, and did I mention that that was back-to-back -back Cinebench runs? So that was like 30 minutes into extreme testing. Yeah, you will never, ever, ever hear the fans on this thing, unless you turn them up all the way. So that's maximum fan speed. Don't get used to it. You're probably never gonna hear that. So in terms of differences to the laptop implementation of this M1 Max chip, essentially what we find here is the CPU performs pretty much the same across the board, whether it's M1 Pro or M1 Max, whether it's a 14 inch or a Mac Studio. So that's pretty consistent. But the GPU, you are gonna get better mileage out of a 24 or ostensibly the 32 core version in the Mac Studio compared to a 14 inch MacBook Pro. But now we gotta talk about the M1 Ultra. How does the M1 Max compare? Is it half as good? Well, in a lot of the benchmarks, to be quite honest, yes. Now, that's not to say that this is slow, that's just to say that the M1 Ultra is quite fast, but in some cases it really showed, whereas in others it sort of didn't show at all. In most of the Blender tests, as well as Octane X, we saw essentially two times the score for the Ultra as the Max. But in video editing, the differences between the M1 Max and the M1 Ultra are really kind of hard to spot. And that's a little bit weird because you would imagine, would you not, that with double the media encoders, you'd be able to see 
that difference in performance. But I mean, in, in all of the tests that we ran, it wasn't really apparent with the exception of Puget Bench and the GPU score, which scaled pretty evenly when you look at the comparisons between all of the different Macs that were tested there. But I mean, in DaVinci Resolve, this was four seconds slower to export a 30 minute clip. Do you really need to pay 2000 more dollars to get four seconds of your life back? I don't know. It's a little weird. It, it's kind of hard to justify the four or $5,000 that I spent on the other two machines when this one for $2,000 is very close. So the news from this video is, it's a little bit all over the place because for 3D modeling, you absolutely get the extra that you pay for with the M1 Ultra. For video editing, it's kind of hard to tell. And for synthetic benchmarks, we saw things were fairly linear. So I guess this isn't really bad news for the M1 Max. If anything, it's sort of bad news for the M1 Ultra because this thing for $2,000 has extremely good performance. I mean, you have to keep in mind that if you enter the laptop space, you'd be paying $2,000 for the double bend M1 Pro in the 14 inch MacBook Pro. So if you have the peripherals, this is a great price point to get an M1 Max. But overall, this Mac Studio is a very, very compelling price point. I think for $2,000 to gain access to an M1 Max or 2400 if you spec it up a little bit, you're in a really, really good position. And I'm just really glad that this machine exists because yeah, the M1 Ultra is gonna get the press. People are paying attention to the biggest and the best, but this might be the best all round because you're not spending all that money to try to push the limits of Apple Silicon. You're just getting a really good package. So I'm curious to know what you guys think. Does the M1 Max 24 core Mac Studio make sense to you? Do you think the M1 Ultra is worth double the money? Let me know in the comments below. And as usual, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, please. And with that, I will see you guys in the next video.